The History of Poland, Episode 21, Like a Wheel. Hello and welcome back. Last time, we wrapped up the conflict between Boleslav and the Holy Roman Emperor Henry V. This episode, we're going to jump right back into conflict between Boleslav and his neighbors, this time with an invasion of Bohemia. As you'll all recall, Bohemia had been not just a part of Henry's invasion force, but in fact one of the key instigators of Henry's invasion. In addition, they had been giving refuge to Boleslav's brother Zbigniew this entire time. Not exactly actions that will ingratiate someone with someone else. So, Boleslav swept into Bohemia with two goals clearly on his mind. First, some payback for the recent invasion of his territory. That would be understandable enough, but Boleslav was also apparently in the mood for some good old-fashioned regime change. You see, during the recent conflict between Boleslav and Henry, the Duke of Bohemia had been killed. In his place, there were two contenders for the new position, both brothers. The elder, Borovoy, had apparently been responsible for the assassination of the previous duke, but in a twist, the duchy had fallen into the lap of the younger brother instead, Vladislav. Fortunately for Borovoy, he was on good terms with Boleslav, who was just about to invade. He did so, and, faced with the prospect of a Polish army invading, the nobles of Bohemia agreed to have Borovoy rule jointly with his younger brother. Boleslav then withdrew back into Poland and invaded Pomerania. Yet, if you think that was all we'd have to say of Bohemia, you'd be sorely mistaken. In fact, Borovoy was almost immediately deposed, imprisoned, and handed over to the emperor. It's not clear from the sources I have access to why the emperor agreed to take Vladislav's side in this internal power struggle, but I wouldn't be surprised if it was because Borovoy had relied on Polish military aid, or because Borovoy assassinated the previous duke. But anyway, Boleslav prepared once more to invade Czech lands. At his side was Borovoy's youngest brother, who Boleslav was keeping an eye on while his older brother was imprisoned. Now, this invasion of Bohemia may feel like whiplash to you, jumping back and forth, in and out of Bohemia. You weren't alone. In fact, Gallus tells us that, quote, the faith of the Czechs goes up and down like a wheel, end quote. Truth, they do go up and down like a wheel. Gallus then recounts Boleslav's invasion of Bohemia in great detail, which I will recount now. Gallus says, quote, Then Boleslav, the warrior, gathered a host of warriors and opened a new path into Bohemia, a marvelous deed for which he can be compared to Hannibal. Editorial note, I don't think it could be compared to Hannibal, but, you know, back to Gallus. As Hannibal, in his march against Rome, forged away through the Jovian Mount for the first time, so in order to invade Bohemia, Boleslav made his way through fearsome paths untried before. The former, by crossing with great labor just one mountain, acquired such fame and renown, but Boleslav crossed not one but several cloud-covered peaks, ascending almost vertically. The former merely struggled to hollow out a mountain in level crags, the latter rolled away stones and tree trunks, climbed towering mountains, opened a new way through gloomy forests, and built bridges over bottomless marshes, never resting. Such labor did Boleslav undertake on behalf of justice and his friendship for Borovoy. After three days and nights of marching, he was exhausted. But such were his exploits in Bohemia that the memory of his triumph will always be recalled. After such perils, Boleslav entered Bohemia at last. But he did not plunder, and then, like a wolf seizing its prey, at once retreat, as did the Czechs in Poland. Instead, he raised his banners, and to the sound of trumpets and the beating of drums, he advanced slowly with orderly ranks through the open plains of Bohemia, inviting battle, but not finding it, and not wishing to burn or plunder until he had brought the war to a close. Meanwhile, detachments of Czechs appeared occasionally, but made off in haste when the Poles fell upon them. Numerous troops also came out from the nearby castles, but when they met the onslaught of the Poles, this offered the opportunity to burn down the suburbs. Borovoy's youngest brother, whom I mentioned before, begged Boleslav to stop the plundering, burning, and destruction of the land. For with a child's simplicity, he thought he could win the country without war, and believed the words of traitors that there was no need for victories. It was now the fourth day, and Boleslav, hastening directly to Prague in expectation of battle, came to a river which was small, but difficult to cross. Here the Duke of Bohemia had taken up a position on the other side of the river with his assembled army, and was waiting for him, relying on the difficulty of the position he intended to oppose Boleslav's crossing there, for he would not have dared to do so elsewhere. But, when Boleslav discovered the enemy he had been searching for, he chaffed and raged like a lion beholding a penned-up prey, for he could not come to grips with them. For each time the Poles marched up or downstream, thinking to cross, the Czechs stood opposite from them on the other side of the river. For according to the lies of the Czechs who were with him, the river was marshy and dangerous for such a large force, even if they were unopposed. 
When Boleslav saw that he was wasting his time in these efforts and that the day was declining and sunset approaching, Boleslav proposed a chivalrous challenge to the Duke of Bohemia. Either Boleslav would give him the opportunity to cross, or he would cross to him if the Duke would move back. He added that he had not come in order to seize the Czech throne, but as was normal, to seek justice for exiles and to take up the cause of the afflicted as he had done for him once. Therefore, he should either call his brother back peacefully to take his inheritance, or the righteous judge of us all should determine true justice between them on the field of battle. To this the Czech duke replied, I am indeed willing and ready to recall my brother, if you will recall yours, but I have not dared to divide my kingdom with him unless on the emperor's council. However, if I had had the desire or the opportunity to join battle with you, I would not wait for your permission, since I long ago had the authority to cross. End quote. So, at this point, Boleslav had marched into Bohemia and was encamped across from Vladislav. Gallus then tells us that, quote, When Boleslav saw that the answers that the Duke of Bohemia sent amounted to nothing definite, that they were just words and nothing else, he moved camp at twilight, the hour of rest, and without abandoning the course of the river, moved downstream towards the Elbe. There, near the Elbe, he crossed the little stream without opposition and hastened to resume war where he had left it. When he reached the Czech outpost and found no trace of them but their footprints, he called his elders to ask their advice. Here he came to a reasonable conclusion about what it seemed could be done prudently and honorably. For some of the elders declared, three days has been enough time for us to be standing in enemy territory to show our valor, and we have not encountered their full force gathered ready to face us in battle. Others said, God's judgments are true, and they are hidden from man. Our advance has succeeded up to now, but if we linger longer, it is not clear which way fate will turn in all this. Boleslav and the younger members, on the other hand, thought less of their elders' advice and were in favor of the previous plan of pressing on to Prague. In fact, the younger faction would have prevailed over the elders had it not been that bread was running out, and bread always prevails over politics. Which, as a side note, I love that line. It's one of my favorite lines in all of Gallus. So anyway, back to what he said. So the decision to return was reluctantly approved, and Boleslav gave permission to loot and burn as they did. He himself, however, was always careful to advance in ordered ranks, and for most of the way he stayed behind with the last columns to protect them. For he kept his divisions in formation to go ahead of those responsible for looting and burning, and also kept an eye out for a sudden attack from the Czechs. So he led his army there and back so cautiously and prudently, and on the Friday set up a camp by the entrance to the forest. He gave orders for more watches to be kept, and for each division to remain at their posts on the ready in case any disturbance broke out. The same night, while Boleslav was still at prayer after matins, by chance some panic seized the whole camp, and the entire army broke into sudden uproar. Then each province and each body of men at arms remained at their posts as they had been ordered, ready to defend their position. The court guard in princely armor rallied around Boleslav, prepared to win or die there. But when Boleslav heard the uproar among his people, he at once ascended an elevation, ringed about by the multitude of his young followers, in order to address them. His words gave fresh courage to his seasoned men, and allayed the fears and panic of the fearful ones. End quote. After giving a rousing speech to his men, which I won't bore you with, Boleslav and his troops then partook in a mass with the clergy they'd marched with. Then they prepared for battle. Gallus tells us that, quote, when all this was properly performed, they advanced from the encampments in their ordered ranks according to custom, and so gradually made their way to the entrance of the woods. But when so large a multitude reached the woods, having no knowledge of the area, and finding no trace of a path, each man had to make his own way through the pathless terrain. Thus they were unable to keep their, to their ranks or standards, for they heard that the way that they had come along and all the others were blocked. So they went back by another path, which could not accommodate such a multitude. But Duke Boleslav remained behind with the princely guard on the right flank, ushering the whole of his army through like a faithful shepherd. But as well on the other side and unbeknownst to Boleslav, Komis Skarbimir was in hiding in light woodland in wait to ambush any Czechs who might be following. The unit from Gniezno as well, dedicated to the patron of Poland, with certain of the Palatines and other doughty warriors, stood in wait on a small plain for their lord as he stayed back. This plain separated the main forest from a smaller wood that stood out. As Boleslav moved obliquely through this light woodland to keep up with his main force, he could see his men, and they could see him. But he mistook his own men for the enemy, and his men similarly thought that he was the enemy. But as they drew closer to each other and could see their arms more distinctly, they recognized the Polish standards just in time to avoid committing a terrible deed. Meanwhile, the Czechs, now feeling almost certain of victory, were racing ahead of each other, no longer in rank and units than before, 
no longer in rank and units as before, imagining that now that the Poles had retreated into the forest they could not be called back to fight, and dispersed out of their ranks and cowering, they could be caught like hares. But Boleslav the warrior, seeing the enemy close, cried out, My young men, let us be the ones to strike first and us the ones to finish. So saying, immediately with his hunting spear he struck the first man in the enemy line to the ground from his horse, while at the same time as he did so, his cup-bearer served a fatal drink to another. Then indeed the Polish youth fell upon them in earnest, clashing first with lances, then when these gave out drawing swords. Shields shielded few of the Czechs who approached. Their armor was more weight than help. Their helmets gave their heads distinction, but no safety. Iron on iron is sharpened here. The daring warrior is recognized here. Brave men by brave are vanquished here. Bodies lie in heaps. Faces and chests are pouring sweat. Streams run with blood. The young Poles cry, This is how men's courage is proven, by thus winning fame and not stealthily snatching plunder and running for the woods in the way of greedy wolves. Those Czechs and Germans in their gleaming armor, who were the first in line, were the first to fall, encumbered rather than helped by the weight. Yet the Duke of the Czechs, though the flower of his knighthood lay fallen, attempted a second and still a third time by turning round his troops to make good his losses, but ever the heap of his slain grew higher. Scarpamir too, with the Palatine Guard, was battling other Czech detachments, but they were separated by a small wood, so that Boleslav had no idea where Scarpamir stood, nor Scarpamir Boleslav, or even if the other was even engaged in battle. On both sides, Mars showed his strength. Fortune played. The wheel turned against the Czechs. The fates cut the threads of the Czechs. Cerberus opened his devouring mouth. The ferrymen of Acheron labored at his portage. Proserpina laughed. The Furies spread their viper garments. The Eumenides made ready baths of sulfur. Pluto commanded the Cyclops to fashion fit crowns for soldiers who truly deserved them, with the teeth of serpents and the tongues of dragons. Why go on at length? When the Czechs saw their cause was not favored by the judgment of God, and that the boldness of the Poles, as well as justice, was prevailing, and the ranks of their best soldiers had fallen, they broke in flight, unit by unit, and man by man. The Poles at first did not realize they were actually fleeing, and thought the rout was feigned, for a valley in the middle in the woods helped the Czechs, hiding whether this was a rout or a trick. Consequently, Boleslav, Duke of the Poles, checked his eager soldiers from overconfidently pursuing them, fearing deceit on the part of the Czechs, and an ambush. When at last the Poles discovered that the Czech flight was genuine, they at once set off in pursuit as fast as their horses could carry them. The Poles, having thus won a triumphant victory, made no delay in continuing their journey home to Poland, taking back with them their comrades who had been wounded in Bohemia, and making, with the addition of those above, the number of days for their journey to ten. For the warlike Czech race had suffered such loss and shame through cliques of traitors that it was practically bereft of its experienced and nobler fighting men after being crushed beneath the feet of the Poles. There too, among the Czechs was Zbigniew, who like them found it more advantage to flee than to stand firm there. The Poles arrived back from Bohemia with enormous celebration, offering up eternal thanks to Almighty God and voicing praises in triumph to Boleslav the Triumphant. End quote. And with that, this conflict in Bohemia comes to a close. There won't be an immediate treaty saying the conflict was over, but there will at last be a breather. But that doesn't mean things are calming down. No, no, no. In fact, next time we're going to hear about a pretty awful moment in brotherly relations between Boleslav and Zbigniew. Here's a hint. It might remind you of how emperors in Byzantium stopped other people from becoming emperor. As always, thank you to all of the supporters on Patreon for supporting the show. And th if you want to follow along with updates for the show, you can follow us on Twitter at History of Poland. On Facebook, you can search for the History of Poland podcast. And you can always send me an email at the History of Poland podcast at gmail.com. Our website is History of Poland podcast.com. And with that, I think you all know how to get in touch with me. So until next time. <laughs>